Uh, very briefly, I'm heading the statistical genetics group in Lausanne. So we are a group of uh, mixed uh, biology, uh, biostatistics uh, background people with a usually strong programming axis. And uh, what we are doing is trying to uh, elucidate the genetic basis of complex human diseases. And you will see from both presentations that both are very much centered on uh, towards this goal. Um, and we are not typical users of, of Bayesian methods, so that's why uh, you will see that maybe these are not the, the classical applications that you see, but, but you will see that uh, this can be, this Bayesian framework is, is very flexible that can be twisted in many ways to, to aid uh, genetic discoveries and, and also aid uh, causal inference techniques. So the first presentation I will give you today in the first hour will be uh, about uh, how we can improve discovery of genetic uh, associations of genetic markers associated with complex traits. And I will uh, exemplify it through uh, the genetic basis of human longevity. Basically, we're trying to predict how long you're going to live from your DNA sequence. So uh, as you can imagine, it's very challenging. Um, but it's also, since it has a relatively minor genetic basis, it's uh, also quite a, a difficult task. And that's why we need help and we need to inform uh, this uh, for these genetic association studies uh, by using other uh, association studies available at hand. And in the second presentation, I will tell you more about how genetic associations can be then um, leveraged uh, to get an estimation of causal effects of a risk factor on outcomes. So here, again, we will look at uh, complex uh, human traits and mostly genetic diseases, uh, gen genetically uh, predictable and, and, and heritable diseases and how we can uh, establish the contribution of non-genetic risk factors uh, to, to these diseases. And of course, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Uh, of course, best is if longer questions come to the end, but if there is something which is uh, unclear, uh, please really stop me. Don't let it uh, boil in you. Uh, so the first part of the presentation will be uh, telling you what is a standard genome-wide association uh, study is. So GWAS, genome-wide association study, is the, the four-letter abbreviation. And uh, I will show you then how we can improve these classical association studies uh, by building priors for the association strength of each genetic variant on a particular outcome. Uh, and uh, I will show you how these priors can help eventually Bayesian association scan. And I will always use an example uh, today lifespan and to show how we can extract and then and, uh, and identify new lifespan associated loci thanks to uh, the smarter uh, Bayesian approach borrowing strength from other association studies or other related traits to lifespan um, and then I will conclude uh, with some follow-up experiments so gene-wide association studies are essentially modeling a, an outcome trait. Imagine here, for example, uh, I always show data. So the, the data is including, for example, body mass index. So it's a general measure of obesity. Uh, the normal range is between 20 and 25. And between 25 and, and 30, people are classified as overweight. And above 30, people classified as obese. Uh, but we keep the continuous outcome. Uh, and we are modeling it as a function of various environment factors. So we call them covariates because that's not our central interest, at least in genetic association studies. And you can see here some examples on the right hand side. I hope you can see my mouse. Um, for example, of course, factors such as age, sex, diet, physical activity, and a bunch of other factors, they impact uh, our body mass index. Uh, but these are sort of nuisance uh, parameters. But the more uh, we can find, the more we can reduce the variance of the error term. So this is very useful for uh, improving statistical strength. And uh, the second component uh, of this uh, model is the, the genotype data. And here I just give one example of one part of the genotype. Uh, so these are uh, genetic markers in the genome, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms, so single variant changes. Um, does anybody know what a SNP is? Or maybe raise your hand if you don't, because then I would just explain a little bit more. Okay. All right, okay, so, so SNP is a single nucleotide variant. Um, this is, uh, you can imagine the, the long stretch of, of DNA sequence uh, of people. And in this long stretch of DNA, 
there are always four different nucleotides, A, C, G, or T, that constitutes the, the DNA sequence. 99.8% of it is identical between any pairs of human beings. Uh, but the remaining part, which is variable across individuals, is the very interesting part, which might be associated to complex human traits. So, if, for example, a person at a given genomic location might inherit an A allele from a father and a T allele from a mother that constitutes a genotype. And we can count here, for example, how many T alleles a person inherited in total. So it can be either 0, 1, or 2. A person can inherit either 0 T allele, 1 T allele, when it only comes from one parent, or 2 T allele, when from both parents this person got a T allele. And that's how these genotypes can be coded. So at each genomic location, you can imagine there are about minimum 10 million such locations in the genome that are variable, uh, that can be examined. And the typical genome-wide association scan, it goes variant by variant. So you can imagine this model fitted about 10 million times, and each time we are really interested in what is the effect of these genetic markers on the outcome trait. And this is the, the model, this is the effect size. And that's what GWAS is after. Um, the, the rest is, uh, you can, of course, have more sophisticated family design or, or, or other different uh, structures based on, for example, geographic location. Uh, and those are kind of structured noise, and then there can be the, the plus the additional uh, classical noise uh, term, which is uh, which is independent uh, between individuals. So this is the model. That's what we are fitting, and we are testing. We are really focusing on the estimate of the genetic effect. For example, here this is uh, one uh, very clear example where this variant is close to the gene called FTO, and here you can see three kind of genotype groups that exist in, in the population. This is data from the small study in Switzerland, in Lausanne, uh, a cohort called Kolaus. And here we classify people according to what alleles they inherited from their parents at this particular location. So every SNP, every single nucleotide marker has an identifier, an RS, and then a long number. It's not very interesting. The point is that if we split people according to how many ALEs somebody inherited from their parents, of course, the maximum is to have two ALEs from both uh, mother and father, we can see that the BMI values of those people are slightly different. And if we pick the regression line, then we can see that each additional uh, A allele is increasing BMI by about 0.7 units. Uh, and 0.7 units is, is quite a lot. Um, this means that these people have on average more than one and a half kilo, for example, who have just one A allele inherited. So these people in general, they have identical environment, but the only difference between them, of course, not the only, but uh, one key difference between them is really that how many A alleles they carry. And you can, of course, in this linear regression, you can estimate not only the slope, but the standard error. And you, then you can come up with AP values. This is a very frequent, with no prior knowledge, no prior assumptions. Uh, it's totally uniform across the whole genome. Every SNP has the same chance to pick up. And then we get the P value, which is, uh, which is not even significant nominally. Uh, so this is quite discouraging because it's a sample of almost 6,000 people, and this this variant has the largest uh, effect on obesity, and we still can't pick it up. <clears throat> now, if you correct for a couple of co um, covariants, as I mentioned, like age and sex and physical activity and diet, then this, this can actually become significant, uh, roughly around 10 to the minus 4. Um, if we do it genome-wide in a much larger sample, so this is a, a result of, of, of such a scan, and this, this result is a visualized often by Manhattan plots. And Manhattan plot, every dot is a SNP, is a marker in the genome. And it's x-axis location. It shows where they are, on which chromosome they are sitting, on which arm. For example, here you see the P arm, the Q arm, of chromosome 9. And, this, um, and they are labeled by the nearest gene. And then you can see there are really association towers, so single nucleotide variants in a given locus, they are associated. And uh, the strongest one that I just mentioned is near the gene FTO. It's probably not the gene FTO itself, which is implicated, um, but some other genes nearby. But the point is that on the y-axis, what we show is the association strength, is the minus log and p-value of the association between this variant and obesity. And then you can see different genomic locations, how strongly they are associated with obesity. And you can see it, that these p-values are very strong, but actually each variant explains only a very, very small fraction of, of variability in BMI. For example, this SNP, this FTO variant itself, it explains only a third of a percent of BMI variation between individuals. So it's, it's really limited in terms of predictive power, a uh, single individual uh, variant alone. Um, since we do roughly a million independent tests, 
we need to correct for it. And typically, bone formula correction uh, ensures that we are controlling family wise error rate. So basically, the probability of making even one mistake if we select and report these SNPs is below 5%. So it's a very stringent uh, criterion. And with this, we can really identify very, uh, very, very stringently uh, low side that are associated, for example, with obesity in this case. But you need very large sample size because to pass this threshold, uh, you need enormous sample sizes because the effect sizes are very, very small. So that's the problem with genome-wide association studies, that huge samples are needed because the traits are very, very polygenic, meaning that it's not only one genetic variant associated with the trait, but really hundreds or rather thousands of genetic different genetic markers across the genome, uh, which can each modulate one trait by, by a tiny fraction. Like, for example, here, the FTO variant is just by a kilo or a kilo and a half. Uh, variants, for example, that impacting height, even the largest ones have an effect of just a few millimeters but we have thousands of them. Current studies showed about 12,000 independent variants uh, contributing to human stature, human height. So the problem is that how can we get more associations than this? Obviously, uh, if we lower the PVL threshold, we can get more associations, but then we will get much more false positives. So we don't necessarily want to do that. The other option is to increase the sample size and increase sample size will obviously yield more associations eventually, if there are more. Uh, but we were thinking about uh, something else going Bayesian. Before jumping to that, I would just tell you first of what, what people, how these genetic association studies can be still useful, even if they are done in a naive fashion. Um, the genetic linear model is modeling the outcome trait, for example, imagine here, body mass index as a um, the genetic matrix. So basically, it's, it's a big matrix. Imagine it's like an Excel table. Um, actually, can you... Sorry to, to interrupt with this. Uh, can everybody put up their hands if you don't know matrix? What is a matrix multiplication? If you multiply a matrix and, this, and a vector, for example, do you know how to do this? Uh, basically, just to, to gauge properly, not to lose people. No. Okay, nobody put up their hands. Okay, that's good. Either you're shy or you're really well versed. Very good. Okay, so uh, here basically we have a big matrix. So this is genetic data. Each individual, each, each row of this matrix represents an individual, and each column is a genetic marker. So what we can very quickly uh, realize is that since we have millions of genetic markers, but we don't have millions of samples straight away in a single cohort, let's say in the Lausanne cohort, we have only six thousand. But even if you take larger cohorts like UK Biobank, we have about half a million people. So we typically we have many, many more columns than rows. So we can't just do a simple linear regression where we are estimating the, uh, each variance effect because we just have too many variants. Uh, so instead of that, we use a random effect model. So we don't really care about individual each individual SNPs effect size on the trait, but what we care about is what is their cumulative effect on the trait. So we model, so we put the prior on these effects uh, that on average, of course, a genetic marker can increase or decrease a trait. A priori, we don't know if, if an allele A would increase or decrease a trait. And also, we can swap and count the other allele at this location and count rather the T allele, and then the effect will be multiplied by minus one. So because of that, on average, these effects are expected to be zero in terms of effect size. But what we really interested in is what is the variance? Because the, the variance would be proportional to the sum of the squared effects, which would be exactly the explained variance of this model. Uh, so we assume that these effects are independent of each other in the genome, and they, uh, they have a particular variance. And instead of trying to estimate every single SNPs effect, we are just trying to estimate what is the variance of this distribution effect. So it's what's called an empirical base approach, where we don't fix a prior distribution with all its parameters and its shape and so on, but we simply, in this case, we fix the distribution shape, but we use the model to estimate uh, what is uh, the, the, the optimal prior parameter that maximizes the data likelihood. Um, Zoltan, so the way, yep. I have a question. When you assume that the SNPs are independent, uh, so you cannot use SNPs that are in linkage then? So you yes, should so take SNPs that are distant from each other? Exactly. So what we do here is that you can throw in any SNP in this G matrix, uh, but the effects will be, it only means that the effects are independent of each other. So just because two SNPs are in linkage disequilibrium, 
they each can contribute uh, to an outcome trait. And those effects can be independent of each other uh, because it's as if we were just putting a multivariable regression, even if two variables are correlated, they will each have their own estimated effects. So we're not estimating their errors will be correlated, but the effect sizes will be not correlated. Uh, but, but it's a very good point. So when um, actually these models can be extended, and indeed what we can do is we can do it in a stratified fashion. And for example, to say that SNPs that have many LD partners, so many SNPs that are in many other SNPs which are in LD, for those, we assign a smaller, we allow to have a different sigma. And those that have fewer LD partners, we they allow to have a different sigma and that typically will be a larger sigma. So if a SNP has many LD partners, then probably these effects are distributed across the different correlated SNPs. And because of that, their each individual SNP will expect it to have a smaller effect. By those SNPs that are sort of lonely, and especially for example, the rare ones, the rare SNPs typically have larger effects. So we can do it in a stratified fashion where we uh, split up the genome into parts which have few LD friends, lower LD frequency. Those typically will, and they can estimate these effects, and we will actually, people have done it, and we see that indeed those variants, they have larger effects. And, Thank you. Thank uh, you. Variants that are also in the coding region, they expect to have larger effect and so on. So you can stratify this analysis if you're large enough samples to have a prior, which is different for different classes of SNPs of, of genetic markers. Uh, so here, just for simplicity, I, I assume very stupidly that every SNP has the same, uh, can, would have the same effect. Um, and then, because then the model becomes very, very simple, then if we want to estimate what is the variance of the outcome, uh, it will be uh, it can be, I will not go into the details, but essentially just knowing the, the variance covariance structure of the effect estimates of the effect of the true effects. Uh, and the, this is the genetic data matrix. So just to remind you, is these are individual times SNPs, individual times genetic variants, uh, plus, of course, the, the error term itself, which is a diagonal error structure. Uh, then, since this variance, that's very important that we assume the independence between them, it will be just simply this sigma g times identity. So that can be pulled out from this equation. And then we divide by m and multiply by m. And what's very interesting is that this g times g transpose divided by m, this is the kinship matrix. Basically, this tells us it's an individual times individual matrix. And in row 5, column 10, tells us what is the genetic similarity between integer 5 and 10. If this value is higher, it means these people are, are highly high, have a higher relationship relatedness. For example, if you have siblings, this value would be about half. If you have identical twins, this value would be one. If you have second degree relatives, then it would be a quarter and so on and so forth. So this is the so-called kinship matrix, and we can replace it by that. So what, what's very handy is that if you multiply the number of markers with the expected variance of that marker, uh, then this is actually the total heritability. So it's very convenient for us because it means that if I just calculate the, the similarity between each pair of individuals in terms of phenotype, that is proportional to the kinship times the heritability plus one minus heritability uh, times an identity matrix, uh, which makes it very convenient to fit uh, the likelihood model. And then we basically have a single unknown parameter in this case, but of course then can do stratifying the genome. Then you have one parameter for each um, group of SNPs. And that would tell us what is the contribution to the phenotypic uh, trait variance uh, of each groups of, group of SNPs. And we can use Hudson Elston regression, which is faster, but it, it has it has slightly higher uh, standard error, which basically what it does is just takes the phenotypic similarities, so it takes the difference between the phenotypes and squares them, and then regress it onto the kinship matrix, and that, that regression is proportional to the heritability. So this is all very useful. We can even use relatively smaller sample size to estimate heritability of BMI, which is estimated in this sample as 0.2. So about 20% of BMI is explained by these genetic markers. Uh, if you look at another obesity-related trait, which is a body shape waist hip ratio adjusted for BMI, that's about 10% heritability. And then we can, since then, people have been doing it in larger samples. And if we really do it in a pretty large sample of about half a million people, then we get about 30% heritability for BMI and about 55% heritability for height. So this is very handy because we know that if, if we have enough sample, so if you just boost the sample size, eventually we can get to, um, to what kind of predictive accuracy we can achieve with such data. So 
this works very well when we have large sample sizes and um, one trait where we don't have typically large sample size is human lifespan, because of course for that you would need to have a cohort where people are all dead and they are genotyped, because then we can associate the age of death with uh, which genetic markers they carried, and then this association could reveal whether there are particular genetic markers that predispose us to die earlier. Uh, so obviously we don't have such cohort. Uh, one option for this is to replace the individual's death, and we use the parental death as a proxy. Actually, what we really do is that we replace the individual's genotype with a parental approximation for the, the parental genotype. And then we essentially pretend to run a GWAS, an association scan in the parents. If, for example, in the UK Biobank and many other trades and many, many cohorts, people who were asked, participants are asked when their parents died, if they, or they are alive or if they are dead when they died. Um, so with this, we can really improve a lot the sample size boost quite a bit but this is still not enough uh, so for that we, we realized it's much more interesting if we build some priors just some background on, on, on life expectancy genetics it's expected to be about 20 30 percent heritable since then uh, many studies so this was from twin studies this probably is largely overestimated it's much more realistic now to assume that it's somewhere around five to ten percent uh, there is a very strong assorted mating so people tend to a uh, couple with others uh, who are going to live a similar age. So there are two reasons. One is because they're going to share lifestyle and it's already initially people tend to pick people who are genetically also predisposed to live the same age. It's very interesting because, of course, we don't know the genetic of a partner when we pick our partners, but we tend to live of a much more similar age uh, as our partners compared to just random pairs in the population. Okay, this was just in parentheses. So genetic studies focused mostly on, on extremes. So looking at people who live extreme long, so over 90 or at 85 and compare it to, to general population individuals. And then they identified uh, the APOE, APOE locus uh, to be associated with longevity, FOXO3 and EBF1. But this had been rarely replicated, apart from APOE, which seems to be coming recurrently uh, appearing. So it's the same variant. It's a very close variant to, to one which predisposed to Alzheimer's disease, to high LDL levels. Uh, the same variant is, is very pleiotropic. Pleiotropic means that it has an impact on multiple human traits. Uh, so the same variant, which is increasing our uh, LDL levels, so the bad lipids, or the same variant, which... Uh, is predisposing us to develop Alzheimer's disease. This, the very same variant at the same allele is also making us live shorter. <clears throat> so this made us think that maybe longevity is more or less just, a, just an accumulation of, of, uh, of bad alleles that predispose us to different diseases. Uh, newer studies, when the first release of UK Biobank appeared there were about 116,000 white british samples for which they run a scan and they have not replicated foxo3 and ebf1 uh, but they found apoe and a new one which is the chrna3 and 5 and i will talk more about it later so we decided that maybe this is now a large enough sample size we could do something smarter than just running a simple GWAS scan uh, and the basic idea is to build smart priors, priors that uh, take into account other studies that, that, that where we can borrow strength from. So how could we estimate the effect of a SNP on lifespan? So if we assume, if we assume that these SNPs affecting lifespan simply by acting through different risk factors, for example, for lifespan, you can imagine that obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia, uh, different cardiovascular diseases are all contribute to shorter lifespan. Then if we know the effect of these SNPs uh, on, for example, body mass index, and if we know the effect of body mass index on lifespan, then of course the expected effect of this SNP on lifespan would be this beta 1 times alpha 1. This would be the product of the two effects. Now there can be additional risk factors, and then there would be beta 1 times alpha 1 plus beta 2 times alpha 2, because this SNP might be pleiotropic and does not only exert effect on lifespan through a single trait, but maybe on multiple traits. So in summary, what we assume is that the effect of the SNP on lifespan a priori should be the sum of the product of these effects, where we sum it up over all the different risk factors. So that's the key idea is that if we know these effects, and these are typically very, very large studies on different risk factors, then we can use these effects 
to inform us about what might be the effect of these SNPs on lifespan if there is no additional effect from these SNPs otherwise on lifespan. So at least we can this way, we can pick up SNPs that are impacting lifespan through detectable and well-defined risk factors. Uh, I will talk more in the second half, in the second presentation, about how to estimate these effects. But for the moment, just imagine that this is known. And of course, from epidemiological studies, these are, have been estimated over several decades with varying accuracy and success. But if you just assume these to be known, and I will not go into the details now, but I will tell you later, that we can actually estimate the effect of these risk factors on human lifespan. And for example, we see that education is something which extends lifespan. So every year you spend in education, it extends your lifespan by the same year. So what time you waste at university is actually add, you given back this, uh, which is a good news, although it doesn't extend uh, to beyond bachelor level. So doing a PhD certainly doesn't extend your life, and maybe it shortens it actually. Um, and the biggest killer is of course smoking, which has the biggest impact. And the best thing you can do is actually quit smoking. So if you ever smoked and you quit then smoking, then the two effects cancel each other out. And the intensity of smoking, how many cigarettes you uh, smoke a day, it has an extra uh, burden on lifespan. And as you can see for most of these diseases, even uh, psychiatric diseases and the classical dyslipidemia, cardiometabolic diseases are all decreasing lifespan to a different extent. And last one, for example, obesity, like every kilo is about decreasing your lifespan by two months. Uh, just as a side note, this is carrying a kilo all your life. So if you just gain a kilo during the Christmas period because you eat too much and then you shed it afterwards, it will have no impact on lifespan. Okay, so let's assume that these risk factors affected on lifespan is known. Then we can plug these back here and then we just need genome-wide association studies that are linking SNPs to different risk factors. And that's what we do in our Bayesian scan. So our null model will be that the effect, um, so we run a GWAS on lifespan. That will give us estimates of the SNP effect on lifespan. That will be gum I for SNP I. And of course, that's just an estimator for the true effect with some uh, variants. Sorry, Zoltan, there was a question, but I had the same uh, from uh, Animesh on the chat. Uh, when you, on the previous slide, when ah, you, yes, it, yeah. when you <clears throat> sum over the risk factor, you assume that they are independent. Exactly, so that's a very good point. So here, exactly what we did, um, in, in this one, we did a, a multivariable man, uh, Mendelian randomization. So we, we're estimating these effects in a multivariable fashion. So we take all these risk factors together. So these are not the causal effect of this risk factor alone on lifespan, but it is a multivariable effect of the risk factor on lifespan accounting for all the other risk factors. So that's indeed, it's a very important point. These risk factors are correlated and these causal effects are of course, individual causal effects might look bigger just because these different risk factors are, are correlated. So we need multivariable causal effect estimates on lifespan. These are of course univariable effects, these are fine. But, but indeed to add these up, these alphas, these causal effects need to be multivariable and, or we need to choose independent risk factors, which we don't do. Thanks, very good question. So th thanks for, I will keep an eye on the chat more often. Okay, so now we have these priors. Um, and so I, I call them mu, um, meaning that simply the, the mu, let's assume that these causal effects are known, these multivariable causal effects are, are known, and these betas we are estimating from other GWA studies. So just a reminder, this beta is the effect of SNP i on trade j, on risk factor j, and we're summing, at it, summing this up over all the risk factors. So that's our prior. But of course, we are not that sure about the prior because this is just an estimate. So it has its own variance. So uh, because we know that these are all noisy estimates or the actual of the actual causal effect of SNP i on trade J, we know what is the variance of this estimator. So we know that the variance of this prior, we are not that sure about it. It has its own variance, which is the sum of the variances uh, times the uh, these alpha weights which are the, the these multivariable causal effects. Of course, in reality, we can be a bit milder and we, we could assume that it's not only these risk factors that through which the SNP will impact the trade, 
So we can even inflate this. We can add some arbitrary constant. We can double it, whatever. It depends on our belief, how strong we believe that we capture most of lifespan effects with the traits we looked at. So if you know that you only looked at a small set of traits, typically we want to increase this, this tau. And if we are very confident that we use a large set of traits, in our study, we used about 60 different traits to choose from. Uh, we, are, we were pretty sure that we're capturing most. So we have a null hypothesis that the effect is zero. The true effect is zero. And we have an alternative hypothesis that this effect is coming from a normal distribution with the mean value is exactly as expected from these mediated effects through the different risk factors. And we have some confidence around these, uh, these priors. So we have two models and we want to compare how likely one model against another given the data that we observe. And the data that we observe is really just the association uh, strength with, um, with a variance estimator, or this is estimated from finite samples. So of course, base vector is a, is a very obvious thing to look at, which will estimate what is the probability of the data given the alternative model divided by the probability of the data uh, given the null model. So in our case, the data is really what we observe is the estimate. What is the estimated effect of this thing? The problem from large GIVA studies with very small effects so of the, these estimates are, are often uh, because of the, the large noise is difficult to distinguish this from zero. And that's where we hope that the prior will help. So uh, we, since we have really simple models, both model one, I mean, model zero is really, really simple because it, it has basically the theta zero parameter is just that the effect is zero. And the other model says that this gamma parameter is uh, coming from this normal distribution. So the, the, the total probability of model one will be when we integrate out uh, all the gammas uh, from this distribution. So here we plug in this distribution into the prior and we take the, the probability of the data given the prior and the product will be integrated out for all possible values uh, of, of gamma. So I just here replaced everything with gamma with the actual values, which is this is this was just a general formula. And now this is for our actual case. That's what we do. And in our case, it's very simple because uh, all, all the, the, the observed uh, data distribution and the prior distribution are all normal. So here, this is just a reminder for the normal uh, probability density function. Uh, this integral is very simple because this is just you plugging in a value, value of zero. You don't need to integrate anything. And here uh, it's an integration of two Gaussians, which will integrate out to a Gaussian as well. Um, and the, that will be the final uh, uh, probability of the data given the alternative model defined by the prior. And here you can see that there will be the original estimation error. So that comes from the, the data. And the second uncertain, the, the second part of this variance comes from the confidence in the prior. And they are just summed up. Uh, and here will be, we are plugging in here our prior estimate, which is we are using now a lot of data from other genetic association studies for the given SNP. So don't, the reminder, I always refers to SNP, SNP I. So we have this base vector, it should be strictly speaking I for each SNP. So for example, one example here is that the null hypothesis tells us that this, we are expecting the effect size come from here. The alternative hypothesis for a given SNP might be, for example, we expect this SNP to be uh, lifespan increasing. In that case, this mu will be positive. It means that we just see this allele and because of this allele effect, for example, this allele is increasing education levels, is decreasing uh, LDL levels, Maybe it's increasing uh, HDL levels, increasing HDL levels, maybe it's decreasing systolic blood pressure, maybe it's decreasing obesity. And through all these positive impacts, we expect it to, to, to also increase lifespan. Uh, and that's why we have a positive uh, prior mean with its own variance. And let's say now we observe a particular effect size, let's say it was two, and we compare the likelihoods of of the null versus the alternative. And that's what this, this the base vector is basically doing. This is coming from the, the GWAS study on lifespan. And this is coming all the other studies where from which we want to borrow the strength from. Uh, 
Now there's an extra complication, which probably I, I won't have that much time to go into, given the limited amount of time. But uh, you will often hear when we hear Bayesian people, since I'm not Bayesian myself, uh, people are very much used to frequentists are very much used to p-values because what the general claim is that if you give a very large prior, for example, to, to many, many SNPs, for example, I give an enormous positive prior uh, for all my SNPs in the genome, then of course, whenever I, by chance, I will get a, I will observe a relatively larger uh, positive effect, then my prior will really boost it and my posterior will be very, very large. And in that case, you might pick up sort of seemingly significant associations, uh, but you wonder whether now how much how dependent it is on the, on my prior. So that's exactly what to we wanted to um, to examine here is that if I now if we were to just generate, for example, a GWAS with fully null effects, basically I'm taking a phenotype which has no genetic basis, or I'm just taking random numbers for every individual instead of taking the actual lifespan value. And I run a GWAS on that. Then, of course, those GWAS will give me effect size estimates, which are totally meaningless. And I can still plug these in, and I will still get base factors. And now the question is whether how different those base factors will be compared to the base factors that I observed with my GWAS. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. So we just basically generated 1,000 null genome-wide association studies. So we generated 1,000 traits which are not correlated at all with any of the genome. And we calculated the base factors for those. So now imagine that for a million genetic markers, now we have 1,000 new base factors generated. And then we compare the two things to each other. We will jump a few slides for the moment, and I come back to this. So these were the distribution, the red one, of the base factors that we observed in our lifespan study. So you see some base factors are gigantic. And this black one is the distribution of the base factors that we get when we generated this 1,000 null GWASs. So if there is no association in the genome whatsoever, then this is the distribution of base factors that we expect to see. So if I see a base factor somewhere here, this is nothing out of the ordinary, but clearly base factors of this range, these are way, way larger than we expect if the, there were no association whatsoever. So at least uh, when all hypotheses are null, so that none of the SNPs are associated with a trait, we can really know what kind of base factor distribution we, we expect, and we can compare that to what we actually observed. And that can give us some confidence, and then based on that, we can generate p-values uh, for each SNP. So because basically when you want to sell anything Bayesian, let's say you, you claim a SNP that had a very high base factor, many of the journals want to see a p-value. And this is a nice way to then associate a p-value to your observed base vector. But now the difference is that we will rank our SNPs based on the, the, the strength, the evident Bayesian evidence of the base factor size, and then we check uh, how what kind of p-value it can translate to. Maybe just some words about, uh, we don't have to be, we can be a bit, a bit smarter than just simulating. So here I just said that we run 1,000 GWAS. I mean, running 1,000 GWAS takes a lot of time because every time you run an association, let's say in half a million samples, uh, your association with uh, more than a million markers, typically 10, 15 million markers, and then you repeat it thousand times, it really burns a lot of CPU. And there is no point doing it. You can One can be smarter because basically the, um, we can replace these gammas by if you divide, divide the, the, the effect estimates with the corresponding standard error that gives us a Z statistic. Z statistic is because it, under the null, it should be coming from a standard normal distribution. And now we're looking at the base factors that we generate under the null. What is nice about it is that we, we need to just plug in these new Z statistics that we generate. And we know that this should be coming just from a standard normal distribution. These are the the effect size divided by standard error. And we all we need to do is to uh, to estimate what this value is. And after a few pages of algebra, we can actually generate this and we can save a lot of time uh, by, uh, by deriving these probabilities. And this can be actually, this led to at least 100 fold uh, increase in runtime. So we can very nicely and quickly get around uh, this problem we don't need to actually generate uh, null GWAS statistics and we can integrate out uh, because we know that these Zs are coming from a standard normal uh, 
these probabilities can be very quickly evaluated. So it's all good. We can now generate base vectors, and on top of it, we can assign or associate p values to these base vectors. Um, and that's where we can convert it to, and that's how we get the p value. Now, what do we get? If we actually run a GWAS, uh, and now we look at those p values that we get from the base vectors, um, not surprisingly, the top two hits are the same two top two hits that were found by the classical GWAS. Classical GWAS only finds this one. Uh, just as a side note, so this EPO, EPO C1, EPO E, it's, it's, a, it's a region with a very large uh, linkage disequilibrium block. So there are really many variants that are in, in closely correlated. So it's sometimes difficult to identify which gene might be the causal gene. Clearly, EPO E is one of the, 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 the strongest candidates. And it makes a lot of sense that genetic markers that predispose us to have higher lipid levels, higher LDL levels will lead to earlier uh, coronary artery disease or stroke that can uh, eventually lead to death. Or uh, if we live through this without any stroke or any major cardiac event, uh, the same variant will also predispose us to develop Alzheimer's disease. And then people tend to also live shorter. So this variant has a double hit. It kills, it tries to kill us earlier because of our increasing our lipid levels. And even later, it has a secondary hit. Even if we survive this, then we might die earlier because of Alzheimer's disease. So this is because it's highly pleiotropic. And that's why it's picked up so, so strongly. Uh, the other one is actually a very simple explanation. This variant is a nicotine acetyl choline receptor. Uh, and those re receptors, if we have polymorphisms in there, you are predisposed to actually much more smoking because you appreciate uh, nicotine much, much more. So when the nicotine binds, it releases much more basically pleasure for the brain. So these people who carry uh, the very functional variant, then nicotine will excite it much more uh, and they find more, more pleasure in nicotine and smoking. And then they, they tend to die, of course, earlier. Uh, if an average person who, who smokes about a pack of cigarettes a day dies roughly about 10 to 15 years earlier. And Carrying this variant is, of course, through, through smoking, shortens lifespan. But if you carry this variant and you never smoked in your life, it will not change at all your propensity to, to earlier death. Uh, so this really shows that these markers are associated with, with longevity. But if the, uh, the, the mediating disease or, or, or environmental factor uh, is not present, then they will not have an impact uh, on longevity. We will find another lipid-related gene, even two of these. There is uh, the very well-known obesity gene. So in total, we find about 16 uh, different genetic markers that thanks to the Bayesian scan, where because of our priors, we, which really gave a boost in the discovery, we can discover now many more loci that are associated with, with human longevity at 5% uh, FDR level, uh, false discovery rate level. Uh, here is more of a list, but also is just to show that here you see that we have a prior, what kind of Z statistic we expect to see based on the related disease studies. And uh, here is what kind of Z statistics we observed in the UK Biobank Association summary statistics. So we see that they are actually agreeing in direction, but typically the observed ones are, are larger. So meaning that the effect that we see are not fully explained by these risk factors that we examine. And it's perfectly normal. If you look at, uh, for example, the APOE region here, we have a massive effect, but just based on, sorry, just based on uh, the effect of these SNPs, for example, here among the risk traits, we didn't even include Alzheimer's disease. We, we really included uh, uh, more cardiovascular traits. So we don't observe everything uh, but it gives us still a good indication, a useful one. The, same, the obesity is different. Basically, the FTO variant effect on lifespan is entirely explained by the mediated effect of this FTO variant through obesity. So here it is a perfect match. Um, but for, in, for the majority of the traits, the effect on lifespan is actually exceeding as much. For, for example, for, for this, uh, the, the cigarette nicotine acetylcholine receptor, we see that the effect that you observe is far larger than what the priors would suggest. And here you can also see some effect that, just to appreciate that these effects are minor. So even if you 
carry the this uh, APOE uh, epsilon four variant, it will shorten life by about five months. So these are not massive effect. Each is a couple of months, and of course the chances to carry the risk allele, uh, which is here uh, on multiple locations, is, is very very low. So there are probably no one in this classroom carries even four of them or five of them uh, at the same time. So these effects just rarely add up and there are only really, really few individuals where all these risk factors are present. Um, and so what, what, what do we see as, as the effect of these SNPs? We can look at the pleiotropic, effect, pleiotropic effects and we see which are the traits through which maybe they mediate lifespan. So for example, um, here, if we look at the bottom SNP, is the this FTO variant uh, on chromosome 19. You can see it has the this very large uh, life decreasing effect, uh, and it's life decreasing because it increases LDL cholesterol, uh, also leads to coronary artery disease. But for example, it, it lowers a little bit the chance of type 2 diabetes. Uh, but it increases triglycerides, it decreases HDL levels. So we see that it has a negative impact on many many different diseases. Uh, but not on type 2 diabetes. Um, and then you can see uh, some other traits which are more, uh, for example, the education driven are here because they're decreasing education. Eventually they lead to uh, to lower lifespan. Of course, it's not education which is lowering the lifespan. The education is just a very, very good proxy for socioeconomic status. And socioeconomic status is a very strong indicator of how long people live because they have uh, just people who have higher education, they tend to earn more. If they tend to earn more, um, Fortunately, the, the, this is British data, so the, the access to health system is, is not the same for people who are more versus less. Uh, they, of course, people who are more, they have access to private care. Uh, they might be more educated to take care of their health, to, to reduce uh, overweight, to move more, uh, and so on and so forth. So it, it's really capturing a multitude of effects and not just a single one. Uh, here you can see this is the, the CHRNA35, the nicotine acetylcholine receptor effect, which is massively impacting smoking, but also is a, also increasing schizophrenia risk. Uh, so you can see the effects are often very polygenic and, and impacting multiple traits. And through many, many different, for example, here, many small effects of a single SNP leading to eventually a life shortening effect. And a couple of these SNPs, at least five, have not been picked up. Uh, by genome-wide association studies for these other traits because their effect is minute on each of and every one of them, but cumulatively they lead to eventually life-shortening effect. So most of the obesity, SNP, the lifespan SNPs are very pleiotropic SNPs and impacting many different factors. Another way to look at, to get more confidence that these SNPs are real and indeed uh, lead to shorter lifespan is that if you look at uh, their association with age, so if you look at the cohort, such as the UK Biobank, uh, you can think about someone who is very old and in the cohort. It means that uh, if you take an individual who is above 75 years old, uh, this individual, part of these people who are above 75 are already dead, and another part uh, don't participate in the cohort because they are not fit enough anymore to, to come and participate in a very lengthy questionnaire, follow up and so on. And th these are really often you have to travel to get to the nearest uh, checkup center and so on. So if you look at individuals who are, who are older and they still participate, they have to be pretty fit. It's a very selected subset of people. While if you look at younger people who participate, among younger people, there would be practically nobody dead and there would be very, very few who are unfit to, to, to participate. So as people are older and older, uh, and we stratify the cohort to, to older people, they are really much healthier people. They are definitely healthier because they, maybe they had a healthier lifestyle, but also they might be healthier because they had luckier genetics for particular diseases. So if imagine that we have a, we have a life shortening uh, variant and it, it has, um, is 30 percent frequency in the full population so when we look at people who are young then there is no selection so all of them are here but if this variant is shortening lifespan then it means that those to be fit they must have a lower allele frequency than those who are unfit and we are selected in this cohort only the fit people 
because those are the ones who tend to participate in such studies. It is called a healthy volunteer bias. So the allele frequency of such markers that have frequently these risk allele appears in older people, it correlates with age. Because if you're older, you tend to have a lower frequency uh, of a risk allele. And if you're young, there was no selection. So it has the, the proper full frequency, in, in this case, 30%. And this frequency goes down uh, as we look at older and older people in the cohort. Uh, so that's what actually we've seen. So here on the x-axis for these 16 markers that we discovered to be associated with lifespan, on the x-axis we show the effect on lifespan. The largest effect is the, the FOE variant. And on the y-axis we show that how much is the frequency decreased by every year. Basically this is uh, the uh, average, the uh, age difference per allele per month. So basically if there's a uh, the, the decrease in the frequency with age, then we, we see those SNPs being low here. And if it's increased, then we see high here. So if something is a life shortening allele, it will be uh, decreasing frequency with age and negative effect on lifespan. And we see a pretty nice correlation, except for three SNPs, that these discovered markers, they seem to follow this pattern that if they are detected to have positive effect extending lifespan, they tend to have a um, less and less frequency in the uh, sorry in increased frequency in the older group and if it's decreasing lifespan it will have a decreased frequency in the older study participants so that's not very not much in line what we expect to see what we also done is as a final slide we also looked at the 16 loci and we try to identify which gene might be a causal gene because of course these are just SNPs, but we need to identify sometimes genes and what is the mechanism uh, through which these SNPs are exerting, for example, shorter lifespan. Uh, and one general uh, consideration is that these SNPs might be changing the expression level of certain genes that are nearby. These are called the CCQTLs. If they are modifying gene expression, for example, in the brain, uh, especially, for example, we look at uh, the, the CHRNA5, uh, that's of course very much brain-centered, the, the nicotine receptor. Um, maybe there we see that the variant, which is predisposing to more smoking, will have if the genes expression is, is higher for those who are more predisposed to smoke, then maybe the, the, the expression of this gene might be causally linked to, um, to for example, smoking uh, frequency initiation uh, or eventually to lifespan. So uh, in the second half, I will talk about this causal inference technique called Mendelian randomization, which is here called MR. Uh, we could identify three genes that are potentially their gene expression in the brain might causally reduce lifespan. And among this, uh, we found actually one of them in a mouse study where we looked at the expression level of this gene and we measured this gene uh, in uh, 70 day, two day old mice. And we looked at as a function of their gene expression, actually we looked at what is the median lifespan of these mice and we see a very strong negative correlation. So it means that in the increased expression level of this, which is exactly what we predicted from the human data, uh, mouse prefrontal cortex expression of this gene is strongly negatively correlated with the, with the lifespan of the mice. So it is just some sort of confirmation that we can, in, an ident in a polymorphism identified in a human study, which is associated to your lifespan, we can move to the gene thanks to expression QTL studies. So we can link now to actual function of the gene in a, even, even a very particular tissue. And then we can follow this up in, in some model organism where we can really clearly see, uh, obviously you will never find a human cohort which measured gene expression of people at a given age as a, as a proxy or, or as a predictor for, for lifespan of these people. So that's where we need to move to, uh, to animal studies. So in conclusion, um, we see uh, many novel loci thanks to this uh, Bayesian approach that we build smart priors that are very informative. Um, we can also assign uh, p-values to boost confidence that these are not just happening by chance. It would not be seen uh, by any random association study just because we have a particular structure on the priors or maybe the priors are too strong. And um, Many of the associated uh, variants are, are, are heavily involved in, in, lipid, uh, in, in lipid transport and lipid metabolism. 
Um, and the discovered laws are very, very pleiotropic, and we could identify really different means and different uh, pathways through which these um, effects are eventually leading to reduced lifespan. And some follow-up experiment has also shown that maybe the expression level of this gene might be relevant and a good biomarker uh, to detect basically accelerated aging. Because if we see that already the, the expression level of a gene at a given age is already larger, maybe this gene might be a proxy of accelerated aging. Similar studies uh, or, or related studies have been looking a lot at methylation levels, which we didn't do that much in this study is that uh, methylation levels are a, a very nice um, footprint of different abuse in life, for example, of smoking, on alcohol use, and so on, which are visible in our, 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 our methylation profile, the same as physical activity. General fitness, is, is uh, th there is a particular methylation profile and methylation probes that are, are correlated with these uh, lifelong exposures. To positive and negative impact, and those can be predictive also of human lifespans. So this is a very active research of finding early biomarkers of accelerated aging, and these SNPs might uh, serve a role here. Okay, if you're interested more, uh, the paper can be looked up too. And otherwise, I would like to thank the collaborators. So it was a collaboration with the team uh, at the University of Edinburgh, at the APFL, and at the University of Lausanne. And uh, also the lead author the, the, who ran almost all analysis was, was Aaron, a postdoc in my group. And I thank also my full group. And I'm happy to discuss more about this. Okay, so I will um, change gears. And uh, instead of focusing on genetic associations, I will focus more on uh, identifying causal effects between receptors and um, mostly cardiometabolic outcomes, but it can be any complex uh, disease. And of course, we will use genetics for this. I will not abandon that part. Um, but basically, uh, an important factor that I already mentioned previously was that sometimes you don't care that much about individual SNPs effect on an outcome. Uh, and that's when we just put a any sort of reasonable prior um, on the distribution of the effects of genetic markers overall on trade, if we are interested in, in uh, other uh, quantities, such as the heritability of a trait, which I, I mentioned in the first talk. Uh, and in this talk, I will mention uh, more that if our center of attention is more on causal effects of a trait on another, uh, that again, it's probably a good idea to not to care too much about individual SNP effects because then these can be integrated out. So it might sound mystical. I will uh, get down to the details. First, I will just introduce a little bit um, you to uh, causal inference uh, and how it differs from simple correlation or simple regression techniques. Uh, and um, the, the central technique that uh, I will be using here is called manual randomization, which is an instrument variable method, which I will describe in full detail. And then I will show you one particular uh, subtype or, or, or an advanced Mendeley randomization, which is uh, using uh, Bayesian priors on, on the, the effects of the SNPs on the exposure and on the outcome. And I will show you how this method works, um, what is the, the key underlying model behind it, and uh, what kind of results can we get, and how can we improve causal inference uh, through um, Bayesian priors on uh, SNP effects. So probably many of you have seen this slide. Uh, this is fairly popular, which correlates um, chocolate consumption per kilogram per year per capita for a given country against uh, the Nobel laureates, so the Nobel Prize winners per 10 million uh, individuals uh, of that given country. And of course, we often show this because Switzerland is topping up, is, is leading both categories. We eat a lot of chocolate, and also this country boasts of many uh, per capita Nobel Prize winners. And the correlation is very striking, is 0.8. Of course, uh, in this uh, publication, they chose countries carefully to, to nicely reflect this, not, not to deviate too much from this correlation. Uh, <clears throat> the question is, of course, does eating chocolate make us smarter? And um, obviously doesn't. Uh, so many times, 
when we observe a correlation between a risk factor and a clinical outcome, it's very often not correlation, uh, not causation. And the reason for this is there are many, many hidden confounding factors. So a confounder is a factor which is impacting both of your X and Y variables. So just because you do a regression Y on X, it doesn't give you a causal effect estimate on X on Y because you could have done a regression on X on Y the other direction, and it would give you an exact uh, same p value and then the the effect sizes would be just the inverse of one, one another. So a regression will never tell you whether um, two traits are really causally related one to another. And very often, if they're just nothing else than correlation with, of course, with some additional uh, covariates that can be included. Uh, in this case, a Nobel Prize in chocolate consumption, the GDP of a country is a very important confounder. Uh, the more, the higher the GDP of a country is, of course, more it can invest into research. And uh, even if the, every country invests the same proportion, but the richer country could invest more in research and also a richer country can invest a higher proportion of the GDP into research, uh, which eventually leads to more lower prices. There is no rocket science about it. There is no, no such thing as smarter people in one country or the other. Uh, higher GDP also will allow people to earn enough money to spend more on luxury products. Uh, such as uh, such as chocolate, and then people will increase their chocolate consumption. And it's as simple as that. Probably there can be other additional confounding factors. But the key here is that there is no causal relationship in either direction, and there's just a simple confounding factor, which leads to very high correlation between the two. <clears throat> uh, there are sometimes true correlations. For example, if you look at what is the correlation between BMI and diabetes, essentially the correlation between these two traits is reflecting mostly a causal effect from BMI to diabetes. And this has been already uh, confirmed by, by many epidemiological studies, interventional studies, that decreasing BMI by a different diet, uh, it reduces uh, diabetes prevalence and diabetes incidence, uh, more precisely in, in such interventional studies. If we look at BMI and physical activity, we see that uh, of course, increased physical activity is tends to reduce BMI, uh, or at least the part of BMI which is fat-related. Uh, but also, people with higher BMI, they tend to do less physical activity. So it's a bidirectional causal relationship, some sort of vicious circle. And then it can be much more complicated ones. For example, BMI and education level. Uh, I have a PhD student who spent uh, many, probably years, or well, at least months on it. Um, the two are, are highly negatively correlated. Um, social economic status is a clear confounder of it. People with higher social economic status, of course, can afford going to university to achieve higher education. And people with higher social economic status also uh, can afford to buy healthier food, which will uh, be less impactful on body mass index, can afford, for example, to, to, um, to have access to to sports, which otherwise might be expensive to pursue, uh, which will eventually also lead to be uh, lower body mass index and so on. There's also a causal effect of, from education level to BMI. It's a very clear causal effect. People who are more educated, they, they are also more educated about the beneficial impact of, of a physical activity of healthier diet. And as a consequence, they will have lower BMI. And additionally, there, um, there is, it's, it's highly debated probably there is not much, or if any, there is a very, very minor, but probably there is, I would rather just more confidently say there is probably a zero effect and no effect from BMI to education level, although uh, several studies show a negative causal effect, but that's uh, uh, that's somehow biased by, by not accounting for it appropriately to parental social economic status. So as you can see, correlation does not imply causation, and and to actually get causal effects is, is much more complicated than than just uh, looking at correlation or linear regression at the estimate. Mendel randomization is a technique which attempts to to derive causal effects by instrumental variables. So the key here is that we we are not looking just at the two traits or potential covariates and so on to 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 estimate the causal effect, but we are using additional factors. So these are these instruments which are strongly correlated. To the exposure. So here, from here on, I will often refer to the risk factor as exposure and uh, disease as outcome. So the genetic markers are correlated with the exposure. 
uh, this can be used as an instrument because if we look at the, the effect of these genetic markers on the outcome, if there is no uh, direct effect from this genetic marker on the outcome, but all its effect is mediated through uh, the exposure, so I'm using obesity and diabetes as an example, then uh, as you've seen before for the, for the Bayesian G was, is that the effect of this genetic marker on this exposure times the uh, causal effect of the exposure on the outcome will give us the total effect of this genetic marker on the outcome. Again, a problem is if the genetic marker has additional direct pleiotropic effect. And as I mentioned to you, and I alluded to, you could see it in the, from this heat map, pleiotropy is actually very often happening. It's, it's, it's a frequent phenomenon. It's very pervasive in, 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 in uh, complex genetics. Um, so we can already be suspicious that probably this condition won't hold. And also what we want is that this genetic marker is not correlated to any uh, confounder of the outcome, uh, exposure outcome relationship. So uh, of course there are many ifs here. What's easy is that the genetic marker, this instrument has to be correlated with the exposure. That's easy to verify, but these two are very difficult and often these are violated. But uh, for simplicity, for the moment, if we assume that these are not violated, then very simply, the causal effect times the exposure effect is the outcome effect. If this really holds, then all we need to do is take the outcome effect and divide it by the exposure effect. And this ratio would be one estimator for uh, the causal effect. The advantage of genetic studies is that we don't only just have one genetic marker, which, which is associated with the with an exposure, with the risk factor, but we have often hundreds of them. So for each of them, we can ask what this marker would give as a causal effect estimate. So what's the SNP i, so the ith instrument, the ith genetic marker, which is associated with exposure, which will uh, be calculated as the ratio of the, the SNP i effect on the outcome divided by SNP i effect on the exposure. Um, it will have a causal effect estimate for the SNP i. And for each of the estimate, we will have its standard error. So we'll know how confident we are, can we, uh, we can be about uh, the, each individual estimates. And then, for example, we can, if you look at the just the, the, the distribution of these different estimates, we can either use the mean, the median, weighted mean, where weighted mean would be to, to these estimates weighted by the inverse of the square standard error, which is called inverse variance weighting. This is a this is a technique which combines multiple estimates together in an optimal way. Optimal in the sense that the, the final estimator of this weighted mean will be unbiased and will be uh, will have the smallest possible variance, which we want, of course, an estimator to be really precise. Um, so this is, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, appealing character, but we can have weighted median, weighted mode. And of course, whenever you hear about median and mode, the first thing that comes to your mind, you use these kind of estimators when uh, you have huge outliers in the data, which can really drive the mean far away, uh, but median and mode are much more robust to, to big outliers. <clears throat> and outliers, in, in our case, really, it means very pleiotropic variants. So how it happens in practice is that we plot the effects of each instrument variable, so each genetic marker, which is associated with the exposure in a very robust manner, if we plot these SNPs effect on the outcome, such as type diabetes, on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, we plot the effect on the exposure. And if we fit a regression line, which is forced through the origin of the zero, zero point, the slope of this regression line is the same as the inverse variance, sorry, estimator, inverse variance weighted combination or meta-analyzed uh, causal effect estimate. Uh, so this is very handy. For example, these are real associations. So here, this is, if you still remember from the first uh, hour, this is the FTO variant. So this is the largest effect on BMI. And you can see that this effect, the, this SNP has also a proportional effect on type 2 diabetes. Um, and and the, when you fit the slope, the slope is about 0.25, if I remember correctly, more or less. So this is the, the estimated causal effect. But you can see, for example, here's this variant, which is way off the line, and these ones and those ones, 
And there might be suspicious variants that they might be pleiotropic effects, and that's why they are off the line, which means that this particular SNP does not only have effect on type 2 diabetes through impacting BMI, but it might have an additional direct effect of maybe 0.01 strength, uh, which is basically just a deviation from this point from the line. So pleiotropy is indeed a problem. More generally, there can be really many kind of pleiotropies. And um, so this is a work by Lisa Nino, two brilliant PhD students in my group. And Nino is already now a postdoc in Exeter. Uh, because this is the general model what we have, is that we have genetic effects, of course, direct effects on the exposure. Those are the great effects. We always want to use genetic markers, which really just directly impacting the exposure. But genetic markers can also have additional pleiotropic effect, uh, that direct effect on the outcome, and then can have direct effects on a confounder, uh, which then has an effect both on X and Y. And this is really dangerous if you think about it. Because if I use a genetic marker, which impacts the confounder, uh, then when we're creating this ratio, which remember the causal effect estimate is just what is the effect estimate of this marker on the outcome divided by the, what's the effect of this marker on the exposure. So now the effect of this marker on the outcome would be gamma u times qy. The effect on the exposure is gamma u times qx. So the ratio of the two would be qy divided by qx. And that's a problem because we estimate the ratio of these two causal effects as an estimator for an XY causal effect, which is totally wrong. So that's a big, biggest problem and biggest danger with uh, these causal inference techniques. If I, we are using variants that are having an indirect effect on the exposure, which acting through something else. And if that, of course, if QY is zero, it will not lead to any bias. But if um, if QY is non-zero and it's a true confounder, then the, 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 the slope estimates will be heavily biased towards the QY-QX ratio. Now, there's of course another problem, which is in randomization, which is assumed that there is no reverse causation. So these three red arrows are really problematic. And that's what we're going to model all in one go. First of all, these gammas are genetic effects. These are direct genetic effects acting directly on X, directly on U, directly on Y. What we, can, what we assume here is that these effects are independent of each other, um, which may not be true, but also if they are not, um, they, they usually these violations happen in very special cases when, when U is a parental trait of X. So for example, if this is your exposure, this is your BMI and this is your parental BMI, then of course these two are correlated. So that's problematic, but otherwise these are typically not, not a big issue. Uh, so we are, instead of estimating each of the SNP effects, which is done in Mendelian randomization, that we really need an, an accurate estimate of the effect of the exposure and the outcome of each genetic marker, and we select only those ones that are acting, uh, that, that are significant enough to be considered. Here, we take this as a nuisance parameter. We don't care about the actual effects. What we really want to estimate are these two causal effects, and maybe these confounder effects. So all of these are nuisance parameters, and we model it uh, with a sort of spike and slab distribution. Uh, instead of formula, I will just describe it in the next slide. So what we assume is that uh, a part of the genome, actually a large part of the genome, typically here I put 90% of the genome, has zero effect on the trait. I just didn't put exactly zero so that I put some variance around it so that it's visible on the plot. So there is a, that's the, the zero effect SNPs, 90%, and about 10% of them, the effects, of the SNPs have an actual effect, a non-zero effect on, a, on, on X, and they come from this distribution. And the mixture of these two, what we will be observing, so it will be still a very narrow distribution, and this really tiny bump will tell us that actually there's this small fraction of the genome which is actually impacting a trait. There have been many methods which estimated this, and for complex traits, probably this proportion of, of non-null SNPs it ranges between probably one and 10%, most of the time, maybe maximum 15%. So that's really great because um, we can now assume this prior, this spike and slab prior uh, for all the direct effects, and these will be independent of each other. Now, I, I just drew the, the this directed graph 
uh, this can be turned into equations. So we're modeling X is impacted by U, by Y, I, and by the direct genetic effects. Of course, this G times gamma U shouldn't be added because it's already included in U. So U is already in there <clears throat> and some error. The same thing for Y. It's also impacted by U with the coefficients of gamma U, uh, Q U, and then impacted by X because X, X impacts Y in a causal fashion. And there, there are the direct genetic effects. And there is the confounder, which has the gamma U effect going in plus some error. So you can see these are the three uh, variables that we are modeling here in this graph. Now, the problem is that U is unobserved. So we don't know what U is. So this equation is not just not here. So what we can do is just substitute U into the other equations. And then we can express X as simply the part of X is through indirect genetic effects through U plus indirect genetic effects through Y. So effects that go through Y and then go back here plus direct genetic effects acting from directly from G to X plus some error. And Y is the same way. It has also effects acting through U, effects acting through G, and effects that are coming directly. So the advantage of this equation now is that here we don't have any more the confounder. Um, and we still have the effects of the genetic markers on the confounder, which we don't know. But this we will not estimate for each SNP separately, but we will just use the prior distribution for this. And we will only estimate the basically the proportion of SNPs that have an indirect effect on X through something else. So this model, this is the, this is the simplified model now without you. If we multiply each side of this model by the genetic markers transposed and divide by N, then we get the marginal estimate. So this will be the GWAS estimates. This would be the simple linear marginal, normal linear model estimates of a SNP K, of SNP k on x, uh, which is the simplest form of linear regression when both x and g are normalized to have zero mean and unit variance. Uh, then, and there is no other variables in the linear regression. That's what we're mimicking here. And that's what we get from genome-wide association studies. So these are just the effect of SNP k on x, and this is the effect of SNP k on y estimated from the GWAS study, both of them. And it doesn't even need to be actually estimated from the G same sample. Uh, so you can see that to get from the actual values of a trait, let's say of BMI, to the SNP effects on BMI, you just need to multiply both sides by this factor. And then you can see that all these constructs of G times gamma will be this SNP K transpose times G times gamma, which is nothing else than the correlation structure, the local correlation structure around SNP K. So that would be rho k, which is a vector which will be listing all the correlation values between SNP k and all the other SNPs nearby. And the same thing for all the other terms. Since all these gammas are just, uh, they come from a spike and slab distribution, uh, the entire marginal effect sizes, so these effect sizes are coming from GWAS. These are now bivariate effect sizes, effect on the same SNP on X and Y. These can be modeled as the sum of uh, effects through U, effects, direct effects on X, and effects on Y. And here, these effects are, again, this is a combination of this random effect times the local correlation structure. Uh, so what happens here is that we can uh, skip a few uh, parts of it. Um, but what is really the, the key here is that we have these multivariable effects where this, this was the spike and slab distribution and it's multiplied by the local LD structure. So this is the correlation between SNP K and SNP J. And this is the multivariable causal effect of SNP J on trait X. And we sum these up and those will be the marginal effects. So really the way to imagine it is that if you have a true causal effect at given locus, then it's multivariable effect. It will be smeared across the whole region. Now, if I have another SNP and I want to just estimate its marginal effect, so simple univariable GWAS effect on a trait, it will be uh, the sum of all the effects of multivariable effects times the correlation between the causal variant and my interrogated variant K. So if these are the causal effects in a locus, 
So here I'm just looking at one genetic region and the blue one, the darker the blue, the, the larger the negative effect is and the, the darker the red, the larger the positive effect is. So if these are the actual causal effects at a given genomic location and whenever it's white, those SNPs have zero effect. And this is my LD structure, meaning that this uh, SNP is perfectly correlated with my SNP K. That's probably actually my SNP K. And you can see that there will be some highly correlated ones, then smaller correlated ones, and then some negatively correlated ones, and then some with completely zero correlation with my SNP K that I'm interrogating. So then the product of these two, which we are calculating here, will be just multiplying this value with that value that comes here. And whenever there is a zero, of course, it will be zero. So we will be only counting the places where both of them are non-zero. So when there is a non-zero correlation and a non-zero causal effect, and that gives rise just to some of these two and all the others will be zero. And we need to sum up these effects. And that will be this uh, ZXK. So that will be the, the marginal effect of SNPK on X. So what we want, of course, this is a nuisance parameter. We don't care about individual effects at all. We just want to get rid of them. So all we care about is the distribution of these. So once we, we already assigned a prior effect on the SNPs, so this is the prior effects on the multivariable uh, SNP effects, which is a spike and slope. It's a mixture of null effects and non-null effects. We can also model the local LD structure. So this is how typical LD structure looks like. This is the correlation with a given fixed SNP K and all the other SNPs in the region. So this is SNP K itself. And you will see there are some other SNPs with very high LD, very high correlation with this focal SNP. And then the correlation dies off with distance. If you move away, correlation here is very, very low. So these are just actual estimates of correlation. So whenever you see a correlation, an LD value that you can download from any databases, it's a mixture actually a null uh, LD, a zero LD, but with measured with noise because the reference panels are of finite size and a true effect. And this is also, it's interesting because the local LD also looks like a mixture of a kind of spike and slab, the LD, and also the, the multivariable causal effects of SNPs across the genome are also looking like a spike and slab. So this will be a, this Gaussian mixture, the product of two different Gaussian mixtures, which will be the, if this itself is also modeled as a spike and slab, this will be a product of two Gaussians times uh, a product of two binomials. So this is the, the product of the two binomials, and this is the product of the two Gaussians. Now the probability density function of the product of two Gaussians is a Bessel function of second kind, uh, which is quite complicated in terms of PDF value, and it's very cumbersome to work with. So that's why we switch from uh, probabilistic PDF function, probability density function to a characteristic function of a variable. I guess uh, you're not all aware of what what is a Fourier transform and what is a characteristic function? Can you just put your hands up if you don't know what it is? Because I think I can just skip that. Ah, everybody knows what is a Fourier transform and what is a characteristic function. No, okay. Okay, I just wanted to check whether you're awake because I guess it's not, not a common knowledge. Um, so basically the, the trick here is that uh, of course, you heard about probability density functions. Basically, when you put a histogram of a variable, random variable, uh, a characteristic function is a transformation of this. Instead of, if you know the density function of that, then this is an expectation of e to the power of i, where i is the square root of minus one times t times x. And that's the value at, at t of the characteristic function. Uh, of course, it might seem completely pointless. Why do we define a new function like this, but actually it's very handy because uh, for many functions, if you calculate the characteristic function instead of the PDF function, the, those are much, much simpler. And if you want to add up multiple variables, you see if it's x1 plus x2, it will be simply just the product of those two characteristic functions. And for example, the characteristic function of this modified uh, second order best cell function uh, is very, it's much, much, much simpler than the PDF function. And to get to the actual PDF of this is very cumbersome, but to get to the characteristic function of this ZK, which contributed to the marginal effects, is, is way simpler. It's just of this form. 
So that's why it's very handy because eventually we can work out what is the characteristic function of the marginal effect sizes, which is a product of three uh, relatively simple characteristic functions. And then in the end, we just need to back transform it where we do the inverse of it uh, to back. And that's the most cumbersome part. So this calculation is super easy and very, very fast. And we just need a fast way to back transform it. And just trust me on this, that there are really fast methods uh, called fast Fourier transformation, which can really in a speedy manner to calculate these back transformations. So we need to move away from the probability density function to something else to get the formulas much, much simpler to get the final likelihood back function. And then we, in, when, then we go back to this characteristic function in the very last step, uh, do the inverse of it to get back to the PDF function. It might not make much sense to you now, but believe me that it really uh, accelerates a lot the, the computation. So now we have a final formula for the probability density function. So we basically integrated out all the nuisance parameters about the individual effects. So we just put a prior on them uh, and we allowed uh, its own, have its own variance and all its mixing proportions and we estimated all those, but we did not estimate at all the individual SNP effects on the outcome. And that's a huge advantage because that gives us much more power because we don't waste our energy on estimating each individual SNP effects. And we can use all SNPs in the genome to estimate now these causal effects, forward, backward, and, and confounder effects. Um, so what happens really when there is a confounder U? As I allowed it to, if you have some SNPs that are directly acting through U, then they will give rise to a different slope when we look at the SNP effects on the exposure versus outcome. And what MR is doing is just blindly fitting a slope to the exposure versus outcome effects. And some of these, these ones are confounder-related SNPs, and these are true SNPs with direct effect on X. So you can see that the direct effect is much smaller than this two. And then we just blindly mix everything together because of course we don't know which one is acting through a confounder because we don't know the confounder is. All what we could detect, all what this is sophisticated likelihood function fitting is doing is basically really just fitting two different slopes to this big cloud of points where we allow to one slope here, one slope there, and there's another slope for the reverse causation. And then there is a null slope, which is has null effect on, on anything. Uh, so that's what all happening really behind graphically is that fitting multiple slopes and afterwards guessing which slope might be the confounder slope and which one, which slope is the causal effect slope. So what do we get? Why do we do all this sophistication? Because then we get uh, very interesting estimates, not only for the causal effects, but for many other parameters. So here we simulated data on 50,000 samples where both X has direct effects and indirect effects and Y is the same way. And of course, the key parameter is what is the causal effect of X on Y? And what is the causal effect of Y on X? In our simulation in this setting, we had no reverse causal effect. We had 0 0.3 causal effect from X to Y. So that's why it's 0 0.3 here. And these are other interesting parameters, which were not really the point of our investigation, but they come out as something additional, which is actually very useful. So pi X was representing the polygenicity of the exposure. It means that what fraction of the genome seems to be associated with the exposure. So here it's a, it's a natural logarithm scale. So it's probably one in about every hundred SNPs is associated with the exposure uh, or, or maybe 5%. Then what proportion of the SNPs is directly associated causally to the outcome? This is the heritability of the exposure which we set as 25%. That's the heritability of the outcome, which we set as 20%. So these are direct heritabilities. And these are the confounder effects. So this is, uh, we set it at somewhere at 0.16 and the other one is 0.11. So what's nice about it is that we fit this model and uh, while we integrate out all the individual SNP effects, we can directly estimate heritability. We can estimate how polygenic the trait is. Basically the larger this pi value, the more polygenic the trait is, the, the larger fraction of the genome is having a co direct causal effect on the trait. And most importantly, it estimates both causal effects going X to Y and Y to X. 
When you look at many other methods that have been designed to estimate causal effects from X to Y, you can see that many of them are underestimating causal effect, uh, depending on different settings, uh, but none of them is really, really accurate in, in most settings. When we use a different setting, the null setting, when the causal effect is zero, both direction, X and Y, Y to X is zero, but we have confounder effects still present. We can't get very accurately those confounder effects, but what's key is that we still get back a correct uh, zero causal effect. While other methods are generally claiming a non-zero, significantly non-zero causal effect. Then we can do different other violations. Now we can put in a strong effect acting through this confounder, uh, which is a negative. So we put here a opposite sign QX and QY, while we have a positive 0 0.3 causal effect, but a opposite signed confounder effect. So when QY is, is not the same sign as QX, so when it's negative, it's positive. In that case, they are misled because if you can imagine the ratio of QY, QX will be now negative. So there is a positive slope, a cloud of points around the positive slope and another cloud of points around a negative slope, which is due to the confounder. And the mix of this positive and negative slope leads to a massive underestimation of the true causal effects for most of the methods that are in the literature. And we get pretty much back what uh, we're supposed to see. If there is a strong negative causal effect, for example, the same way these effects will be uh, massively underestimated. So we convince there, at least ourselves, that in many simulation settings, when we violate these Mendeley randomization assumptions, so there is a heritable confounder, or there is a reverse causal effect, or there are just pleiotropic effects, the methods can be massively driven by by SNPs that are not acting directly on X or SNPs that are acting either directly on U or directly on Y. And, and that's a problem. And we seem to be able to solve this. Um, what's interesting is that I briefly mentioned genetic correlation. So traits can, you can just look at the correlation between two traits that gives some idea of, of how similar they are. They might be either causal or they might be a confounder. Uh, a slightly different aspect is genetic correlation. When you, you only use the look at the, the genetic part of the trait and you ask how correlated the genetic basis of the trait is. You can the same way you can ask how correlated the environmental component of these traits are. These are, we looked at 13 trait pairs and for every pair we calculated the genetic correlation. And with this model, we can also estimate what kind of genetic correlation we, uh, we expect to see for X and Y based on our model. And that very nicely agrees with the observed genetic correlation. Then we looked at really the most interesting part is basically running this method for every trait pair. For example, look at BMI. What is the causal effect of BMI on systolic blood pressure? You can see we get back a nice positive effect, which is, has been confirmed many, many times. The effect of BMI on type 2 diabetes, this effect is again uh, as expected and as is, it's in the literature. Um, for example, we get back the effect of smoking on myocardial infarction, very strong causal effect. The effect, the positive effect, the sort of healthy effect of education on coronary artery disease, on diabetes, also high education decreases smoking and so on. So many of these good effects of, of, of uh, higher education is, is also picked up by our method. What's also was very interesting that, of course, our method also estimates the confounders. So, for example, when we look at birth weight and type 2 diabetes, many methods are showing a significant causal effect between uh, how heavy you were at birth and whether you developed, how early you developed type 2 diabetes or develop at all. We observe no causal effect. It's a non-significant uh, negative effect with a large confidence interval. Uh, and it also implied that our model said that there is a confounder which, had, which has the same sign on both type 2 diabetes and birth weight. And uh, when we look at a large number of traits, which could be potential confounders, parental obesity seems to be one of them. Parental obesity increases birth weight and parental obesity, it also increases the predisposition of the offspring's type 2 diabetes even. So it's quite interesting that Although even causal effects seem to be, causal models seem to be uh, 
confused by this and assuming that there is a causal effect going from birth to diabetes, but actually we managed to identify that there is driven by a confounder and upon when we look for what could be a confounder and actually scanning through traits, we identified one potential typical uh, confounder traits, which are a lot of obesity-related phenotypes, even fat-free mass, but also fat mass. Another exa exciting example is, for example, HDL levels and systolic blood pressure, where we see a negative causal effect. So higher LDL, uh, higher HDL level is decreasing systolic blood pressure. So it's uh, it's another benefit, beneficial effect of of, uh, of, of the high-density lipids, uh, which classical Mendelian normalization doesn't pick up. And our method picks up also that there is a confounder effect, which has been actually uh, the authors of this paper contacted us and they told us that they see in our paper and that they, we suspect that there is a, a positive confounder of this relationship. And in their paper, they show that this is actually alcohol, which has the causal effect on both of the alcohol consumption. And there are, of course, many others, for example, height, decreasing systolic blood pressure, what we see, we expect to see, and yet to discover another trait, which is a confounder of this relationship with equal positive effects on, on both of them. If you're interested in more, this was uh, published about a year ago. Um, again, I, I would like to acknowledge Lisa Nino, who, who did the, the lion's share of this work, uh, of all the uh, simulation and, and real trade association results. And with this, I finish, and I'm happy to listen to your questions. <laughs>